when chalk was a problem, remember, chalk in our schools and uh, the former press, when it was a problem. Today we have acquired tablets to give to the students. Every senior high school senior is getting a tablet that we, we, we have. So I'm just putting. fully perform its functions. Again, another NPP president, Nanadu Danko Akufuado, passed the right to information law to enhance the work of the media. We are partners with you, and a partnership I will continue to keep as the new leader of the NPP. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, in November last year, similarly, some have offered advice. I've also taken advantage of my engagements to recount the many successes of the government of President Akufuan. I have also, in my encounter, encounters, acknowledged the economic difficulties citizens have faced, from, especially between 2020 and 2022 and the interventions we've made to bring back the economy. Last week, the MPP presented its 2024 manifesto in Takradi. In our manifesto, we have laid down comprehensive economic proposals to sustain the rebounding economy, reduce the cost of living, stabilize the currency, empower businesses and reform tax administration and deliver jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to deepening media freedoms and plurality. Recognizing the vital role of the media in promoting democratic governance and economic development and in preventing disinformation in the digital age, in line with our philosophy and reaffirming our commitment to upholding the fundamental right to free speech and media freedoms and expanding the frontiers of individual rights, we will pass and fully implement the Broadcasting Bill, if not done before the final session of Parliament this year, to better safeguard media freedoms and pluralism. Further, resource the Media Capacity Enhancement Program to continue enhancing the knowledge and skills of journalists, continue to implement the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, strengthen public media, including the GBC, GNA, community radio, and other public media institutions to promote diverse perspectives and voices, modernize and retool the information services department to enhance its effectiveness, better resource the National Media Commission to execute its mandate, and enhance access to information by facilitating right to information requests by the media petitioners and citizens who cannot afford access to information. We also want to preserve our heritage by working with tourism, creative arts and heritage stakeholders to embark on a massive archival project to protect our historic forms and documents. Finally, harmonize public relations at all ministries, departments and agencies to promote effective communication. Ladies and gentlemen, I represent the future. In 
Ghana needs an upgrade and not a reset. And so I also outlined my 14 key commitments to the Ghanaian people. These are to sustain and expand Ghana's rebounding economy, create new jobs, implement wide-ranging tax reforms, build Ghana into a world-class digital economy, reduce the cost of living, expand public infrastructure, provide better health care for all, implement affirmative action for women and girls, and expand educational opportunities for all, provide good governance, care for the elderly, protect our environment, boost sports, creative arts and tourism, protect our borders while keeping our neighborhoods safe. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is an opportunity for the media to thoroughly examine the proposals in our manifesto and offer criticisms where necessary. We are ready to listen. Let me take advantage of your presence here to state my firm commitment to free, fair, and peaceful elections in December. The quest for political power should not be an end in itself. It should be mounted on the desire to transform lives and make Ghana, our motherland, a better place for us all. However, it is becoming increasingly worrying that some people have gained the notoriety of churning out incendiary language, threatening fire and brimstone if the good people of Ghana give the mandate to rule to a group other than theirs. Whilst nobody profits from violence and chaos, it bears repeating that not a single drop of Ghanaian blood should be sacrificed for power. Our party is determined to pitch our ideas, as we have always done, and to demonstrate the superiority of our ideas over and above what any other party can offer. My pledge, and that of the MPP, is to run a campaign of ideas and to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of a democratic group. Our main goal is that at the end of the contest, we carry on with our lives secure in the knowledge that there is work to do, work to sustain the rebounding economy. To those who threaten war, mayhem and violence, my message to them is that this isn't Ghanaian. Our pursuit of power must be paired with the compelling need to allow the Ghanaian to continue to enjoy his or her peace. Ghana will exist long after we've all left the scene. Thank you for your attention and I will see the microphone and take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. They say these days, ladies and gentlemen, very mindful, very cutesy, very demure. Please put your hands together for the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. We now cede the microphones to our friends from the media. Please, the numbers. As we all acknowledge, it's quite huge. And so we have the microphones in the various lanes. You we'll lift your hands, then we we'll call you, then you we'll speak. But before anything, I think it's only fair that we let the vice president of the GJ speak first, then the floodgates will be open. Okay, Madam President, is there. DJ, please let's hear from. Vice President of the DGA. And please let's be very brief with the questions. Please go ahead. Thank you very much.
much, Your Excellency. This engagement has been a long standing one. It is something that we've been yearning for for a very long time. And thank God that you've paved the way for us today to have this engagement. Thank you so much on behalf of the Ghana Journalists Association. I have two simple questions to ask you, Your Excellency. What is your commitment to media freedom? And how would you urge your supporters to refrain from attacking journalists, especially during electioneering, as we are in some few months to go? And also, how will you deal with your supporters who act in such a manner? The second question, Your Excellency, the media industry in, is currently facing serious financial distress. Some media houses are folded up and there are hints of imminent sale of state-owned media. What are your thoughts on selling the state-owned media and how would you help the media industry to overcome the financial distress if you are elected as president? Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. So only the DJ gets to ask two questions, please. Order. We'll take about six questions. I'll keep my questions short as myself. <laughs> <laughs> Your Excellency, uh, former President Mahama says you were supposed to be an economic designer, uh, but you seem to have failed in the management of the economy. Do you have any response? Okay. It's an imperial. I see Alice, we get stay ready. So we'll keep moving. Thank you, Mr. Senator. My name is Yesel Perra Imanza Mati. I work with Afima FM of the media and the Asian Capital. My question is very simple and short. Is there anything you have disagreed with in this government as a vice president? Thank you. Fund? Is that a private sector or is it PPP? So that's my question one. Thank you. you have then question two. No, and I it. And I am not that. No, so 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 yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, Make it short. Okay. So, still on the EV, we know that most of these charging ports for green mobility innovation, they must be powered with green energy. So, are we already adding on to our energy mix, which is the brown, making it counterproductive, or we build dedicated solar panels for this charging port? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, I think we'll go to the, this side before we come back. Thank you very, very much. I think uh, those are pretty tough questions. <laughs> um, the first question by the Vice President of the GJA <clears throat> was on commitment to media freedom. Um, and I think that commitment is very absolute. I think the, the press and, and the I mean, people have fought and have lost their lives even to get press freedom or media freedom in this country. And a lot of the times we take it for granted. But I think that media freedom and, 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 and is so pivotal to the whole democratic exercise that we are at a difficulty. I mean, that's, uh, the lack of media freedom is a characteristic of you know, societies which are more dictatorial. And I think one of the uh, things about Ghana that everybody who comes here really appreciates uh, is the freedom of, of the media. We, you, we talk a lot on radio, TV, all day. And so I'm very committed to this because I'm uh, inherently someone who is very committed to democracy. And I don't think that anyone should attack a member of the press uh, for doing their job. And so we will totally be against that and uh, ask all our supporters they, to refrain absolutely from, from doing that because that undermines the very democracy that we, we, we are doing. You know. So I think that one is, is clear. Um, the issue of selling state-owned media, I, I'm not 
aware that anything of that nature has come to cabinet, but should it come, there has to be a justification for it. We will await any such um, thing that, that will come. I'm not uh, aware that there, there is a, a, a you know, proposal uh, to, to sell uh, the state-owned media. Uh, but if it, it comes, it has to be justified. And of course, a big decision like that will have to be undertaken with a lot of consultation of, of stakeholders. Um, the third question, was a set, yeah, third question is about what the former uh, president uh, supposed to have said uh, about me being an economic messiah, supposedly, uh, who has failed. Um, sometimes I get a little surprised and, uh, and amazed uh, the former president when he talks about economic mismanagement because <laughs> he, should, he, he, he should know his own record. I mean, we don't all have short memories. We really don't all have short memories. His record in economic management, what he left us with in 2016, was an abysmal record. Just an abysmal record. We had endured doing so for four years with all the destruction of industry and livelihoods. That people died because of those the hospitals. The National Health Service was virtually collapsed. Remember, we are basically back to a cash and carry system. The National Ambulance Service was virtually dead. We had only about 37 ambulances for the whole country. Unemployment as a result was very high. Agriculture, GDP growth had declined to 3.4%. 3.4%. Agricultural growth had declined to 2.9%. Of course, industry growth had collapsed because of dues. Unemployment was high. There was a freeze on public recruitment as a result, and the banking sector was virtually, was on the verge of collapse. We have, as a result, the cancellation of teacher training allowances, the cancellation of nursing training allowances. You had a three month pay policy for teachers who worked for three years and they paid, and many children could not attend senior high school because of difficulties of paying fees and so on. You had many, many challenges that he left us with. You know, so when you juxtapose that record with what we have been able to do in these last eight years almost, it's really night and day. You know, we have created at least 2.1 million jobs. Um, the latest number I saw was 2.3 million. But let's say at least 2.1 million jobs in the last seven years. And this is hard data I'm talking about, 2.1 million jobs. We've kept the public sector workers employed and fully paid through the COVID pandemic. We didn't lay anybody off. And if you look at it, we built more roads, more roads, three times more the length of roads than what he did in office. We built more railway than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Expanded rural telephony. There were 78 sites for rural telephony when we came in. Today there are 1,008 sites for rural telephony. We built more libraries, public libraries, than any other government. I mean, his time, he built only three, eight years, three public libraries, eight years. 
And we've built 54 public libraries in Egypt. We've constructed about 12 major fish landing sites across the country. Xin, Dexco, Marie, Bamford, Wilba, Senyakuriku, Gumwa, Fete, Teshi, Osu, Ikumfi, and Fatsima. Constructed two fishing hubs in Elmina and James. Constructed more sanitation facilities, 817, than any other government. This has increased the proportion of the population with access to toilet facilities from 33% in 2016 to 80%. And 5,400 communities have been declared open defecation free. We built more sports facilities in Ghana than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Mm whether you're talking about Potemann, or the University of Ghana, and so on. When we came into the office, there were only three astronauts in the whole of Ghana. The whole of Ghana. Three. Today, you have over 150. We've abolished the three-month pay policy, constructed 120 courts were constructed. 80 have been completed with bangles. Um, and we've kept the lights on. Live rolling in the last eight years. We restored teacher and nursing training allowances. We increased the beneficiaries of scholarships by 70%. And the national health insurance is now being extended to cover sickle cell patients with hydroxyurea, very expensive drug. I led the negotiations for that to happen. We have extended the national health insurance to cover childhood cancer, extended the national health insurance to cover kidney dialysis for over 60s and under 18s. We saved the deposits of 4.6 million bank depositors who, who really um, we're going to lose their deposits if those banks were not, were not saved. I don't understand whether the former president has taken his time to actually understand what happened in the banking sector. Some atrocious things happened. And this is why these banks had to be saved. They were not collapsed, they were merged into other banks. And we no banking depositor lost one city. Everybody maintained that you had uh, very bad things happening. You know, some of the banks broke all the rules and extended loans way above the single optical limits. We were given, in some cases, one billion cities by the Bank of Ghana to help them get out of the mess, and they only got deeper into the mess. Another bank was giving capital to save the situation, was giving money from the Bank of Ghana's lender of last resort facility, and they used that money to go and set up, took money and went and invested in private or property. So, so it was against this background when the, the governor came to report, and this was one of the, the, my nightmares as in the last eight years. I couldn't sleep that night that the banking system, how, most people didn't understand how close we were to a collapse of the entire banking system, that we were this close, because all it would have taken was for a few depositors to go to UT Bank or UNT and they'll tell you there's no money. What would happen? There would have been a complete run on the banking system in Ghana. We would have lost, we would have collapsed the banking system. When the governor came to the port, that we were on the verge of collapse. When chalk was a problem, remember, chalk in our schools under the former president, when it was a problem. Today we have acquired tablets to give to the students. Every senior high school senior is getting a tablet.
that we, we, we have. So I'm just putting some of these points together. You know, Agenda 111 so far, built 47 hospitals, 428 chips compounds, 230 health centers. I mean, that is massive. That's excluding Agenda 111. Brought in drone delivery. Ghana is now the whole world's, the largest medical de drone delivery service in the whole world. We're leading uh, the world. The ambulance service which was collapsing, we brought in one constituency, one ambulance, and we are making a lot of um, progress in that direction. So I think that, I mean, what is clear, I, I, I don't have to go through every sector. I, the data, for me, I speak only with data. The data is very, very clear that we have our government, we have outperformed the government of former President Mahama in the management of the economy in virtually every sector. Virtually every sector. You tell me whether it's GDP growth, whether it's per capita income, whether it is industry growth, I mean, Virtually every sector we have performed. So he either does not read or he does not understand the data. He needs to do one of the two. Take his time to read the data and understand what it is before he comes up to speak, because he will speak out of ignorance. But if you understand the data, and I believe that as a former president, he does understand the data. He must understand the data. And I believe that is why he doesn't want to debate me. <laughs> I believe so. That is why he doesn't want to debate me. He's, uh, he's running away from that. So if, according to him, our we have mismanaged the economy. In the midst of a global crisis, in the midst of a global crisis, if our mismanaged economy is outperforming you in virtually every sector, this economy that you are saying has been mismanaged. We are performing you in GDP growth, in per capita income, in gross international reserves, in every sector. Roads, hospitals, schools, everything. Free SHS, all of them. If this is a mismanaged economy, that is our performing you in your economy that had no global crisis. No crisis at all. But you couldn't afford chalk. <laughs> You couldn't afford chalk, but there was no crisis. So if our mismanaged economy is performing better than your, man, your better managed economy, uh, then <laughs> in that case, you, you must not have been very good. Let me put it my own. I was going to say incompetent. <laughs> because <laughs> how bad economy is very, it's much better than your good economy. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I think that the matter, I hope, that this matter can be settled. There, there, there's no way, there's no way he can say that his economy, that he managed as, as president, by the way, I'm not yet president, in another three months, it shall. Yeah. yeah, I mean, let, let us settle this matter. And you are members of the press. You, you read the data. You follow the data. You know the data. You know that we have done better than him. So why does he want to come back? I mean, it's like you go for an exam with someone in school. You score 70%, they score 30%. And you want to convince people that they are better than you. 
It doesn't make sense in, the, in that sense. So I, I, I seriously believe that that statement, you know, um, that we have failed. Uh, of course, we've had challenges. Nobody can say we haven't had challenges. We, we have had challenges, serious challenges, challenges that have kept me up at night. In 2022, that was a horrible year for us. 2022, petrol prices went up to 23 cities per liter. We were losing reserves so badly, you know, and you saw food prices going up and all of that. That was a real challenge that we had to deal with. And this is how we came up with the whole gold for oil gold purchase program, and that has really helped us. Today, God, today, notwithstanding all the challenges, we are the 10th lowest price in terms of petroleum in Africa, the whole of Africa. Ghana is number 10 in those of lowest prices of petroleum. We are number 10, 10th lowest. The lowest is Libya. Then you move through Egypt and Sudan and all of those who come to number 10, which is Ghana. Ghana, we are priced around 13, 14 cities per liter right now. Cote d'Ivoire is priced 23 cities per liter. As uh, Hassan was just telling me earlier on when I asked. You know, 10th lowest. Uh, we, are, we still want to bring it lower. But in 2022, at the time I announced Gold for Oil program, and I said we had to attack this thing with Gold for Oil. The prices were 23 cities per liter at that time. So uh, we've had challenges. It's not uh, everything is, is not where we want it to be, but I believe that we can work better. But I don't think the former president can lecture us on economic management. He just cannot. His record would not allow him. Is there anything you have disagreed <laughs> with in this government? Um, the issue um, when you sit in cabinet, you have collective responsibility. That is fundamental to government. When we sit in cabinet, we argue on many, many issues. And everybody brings their mind. And sometimes your view prevails, sometimes it doesn't prevail. But once we take a decision, it is a collective decision. And so I cannot come out and say that the decision that we collectively took, I disagree with. No, I'm bound by it. That is the future of public responsibility. The question had to do with the rising cost of living, and I'm very happy you are raising these issues um, on the EV, electronic, uh, electric vehicles. Um, you're right, one of the ways that we want to reduce the cost of living is through bringing in public transportation, the electric buses. And you know, so that is what is going on. We're bringing in about 100 to start with to essentially do the pilot for it. Um, and the issue that you raise is a very, very fundamental one, which is the charging stations for these electric buses. Uh, and I must tell you that Metro Mass uh, is working very, very hard as we speak. Uh, to put in the charging stations. So we will have the charging stations in place uh, by the time uh, the buses get here. So that is clearly a very, very important one. Um, and the issue of green energy, um, whether you're going to, to try to bring in uh, solar to charge um, these batteries, I think it is definitely going to be important. Um, as, because in general, if you read that particular chapter, I want Ghana to move towards solar power. And this is where I think we should be going.
growing. And this is why I want us to bring in 2,000 megawatts of solar power uh, in the next four years to, to really bring down the cost of power. Um, we've seen some work already being done by Hui Power uh, in terms of the solar area, but we're going to really expand it. So in terms of all these buses, all these uh, government buildings, all the schools and so on, I want to move them all towards green energy, solar power, and I think that is where we should, we should be going. Um, I think that um, the, the other question was on job creation um, for the young people. I think that is at the heart of, of the manifesto, that you want to essentially um, move to create the environment and the, put in place the policies that will help business and that will help jobs. Right, so that's why we're talking about bold solutions for business and jobs. I think that is so critical. Uh, and I think that there are many areas that we are, we are touching on uh, for the young people to get the jobs. We, 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 I think that, I mean, the, the two are very linked, business and jobs. If you let businesses grow, then the jobs will also be created. And so we are looking at helping businesses grow um, by putting together our uh, implementing uh, our legally backed uh, Ghana Fest policy so that the procurement by the public will be focused on things that are produced in Ghana first before they look outside. So that is a very important part of the, the, the policy mix that we are coming with. That will make people hire more and we will get uh, more jobs in, in that sense. Uh, we also have a major tax program uh, of tax reform uh, to make the business environment very, very good uh, and easy to comply with. So we're bringing in a flat tax system uh, as exists in Estonia. Uh, we are also bringing in a tax amnesty for business um, so that we can all start on a clean street and, and move forward. We believe that you know training the youth will be very, very important. So the investment that we're making in TVET will continue. Um, the focus, the setting up um, an open university with a focus on ICT, TVET, and also um, the, the, the whole STEM area as well. So we want to, to, to do that, but we also um, are trying to get our youth trained in digital skills. I have a program for one million youth to be trained in digital skills. Um, uh, it's a broad area of training uh, for the youth because the jobs these days are more increasingly more in that space. And I think that we can have a situation where a lot of our youth are here and they are working whether in America or the US or Canada uh, right from, from Ghana here and, and so on. So, so these are some of the areas that we think we're going to, 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 to get going, um, the infrastructure area and so on, that will expand the economy uh, so that we can create more jobs for our, our people. And of course, setting up the SME bank, setting up you know, the credit scoring system to allow people to get credit and move Ghana towards that system. Uh, we may have some time to talk more about some of these, but these are some of the areas we want to, to get the youth uh, totally uh, involved and empowered to get jobs. Thank you very much. I'll take